Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. One of the wonderful things about diving into scripture and preaching at this stage in my life is that this is my first time preaching about one of the best known parables in the gospel narratives. It's a novice mistake to think that there is an original thought to be had about the parables. We're humans, after all, and as Ecclesiastes reminds us, there is nothing new under the sun. Yet, as we know, Jesus' use of the parables creates original meaning for all who hear them. Parables are, in fact, poetry. They're fiction, and as such, they leave space for the hearer's imagination. They're meant to challenge our perspective. Jesus is a master at turning his audience's expectation upside down, leaving us now, some two millennia later, wondering what his message might be for us. Richard Lisher, in his book, Reading the Parables, writes, and I quote, one suspects that Jesus does not perform his stories to clarify a theological point, but offers them as a lens through which to glimpse the actual presence of the divine in the ordinary situations he depicts. If one cannot enter the kingdom amid the pots and the pans of daily life, of what earthly use is the kingdom? This parable is Luke's second example of a two-part lesson given on how we should think about prayer and God's mercy in the present kingdom. In Reverend Massoud's sermon last week, we heard the parable about the widow and the unjust judge and the lesson about persistent prayer. In this parable, Jesus calls for humility in prayer. But is it just a parable about how to pray and how not to pray? Now, at first glance, it can feel like Jesus is setting up a kind of a counter between somewhat uh, two cartoonish characters. Scholars underline the exaggerated personalities of these stock characters as, as frequent foils, interlocutors, debate partners, if you will, in Jesus' parables. His audience would have been familiar with them. The Pharisee who separates himself from the rest of the crowd thanks God that he is not like the riffraff of humanity that surrounds him. He is confident in his extra almsgiving and in good works, reminding God that he goes beyond the call of duty of an observant Jew, hoping that, that God will look favorably upon him. He is engaging in a kind of moral bargaining. The tax collector, standing even farther off, exhibits signs of remorse and penitence, seeks forgiveness for his sins, his prayer simply asks for God's mercy. Over and over, modern commentary underlines how important it is for readers to understand that everyone in the story is suffering under Roman law, the same oppressive Roman law. The Pharisees are not the bad guys. They're trying to uphold the Torah, offer guidelines for living in the law according to Moses, Jesus was in constant conversation with the Pharisees. He studied, he ate with the Pharisees. As we know, early church interpretation picked up on anti-Jewish tropes which blossomed in the Middle Age. Matt Skinner, who's a professor at Luther Seminary, writes, and I quote, be aware that the Christian use of the word Pharisee as a synonym for hypocrite is inappropriate. It neglects the way in which Jesus and Paul's teachings rose from Pharisaical influences. It implies the gospel combative depictions of Pharisees are historically precise, and it resurrects anti-Jewish tropes. This matters because even as we know that both men represent typologies, the reality is still some, maybe unconsciously, associate one man with the Jewish faith and one man with the Christian faith, and this sets up dangerous boundaries that we're still contending with today. For me, the parable is much more about our universal impulse to bargain with God and God's favor 
When I picture the, par the Pharisee, I see a lonely and frightened person endeavoring to create for himself a cocoon of safety, of favor, separating himself from all who might pollute his bargain with God. The beauty of the parable, however, is the way that Jesus draws the hearer into a snare. Who hasn't thought, thank God I'm not like the judgmental Pharisee. I think we can see the irony in that sentence. The poet Christian Wyman wrote, we should all be suspicious when God's call conforms so neatly with our own inclinations. I am convinced that we are all both the Pharisee and the tax collector. We are all bargaining all the time with God, even those of us who are convinced that we have the memo that God is in control, still harbor hope that our virtue in this life promises us just a little more good fortune in a chaotic world. I know I talk a lot about my work um, with cancer patients at Sloan Kettering in New York, but for me, it's where the most vivid examples of moral bargaining take place. I recently had a conversation with a uh, a patient who's a professor with a difficult cancer who kept telling me that he was a good person, liked by his students, someone who went out of his way to work with his students after hours, helping them through the challenges that were outside the classroom. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income, says the Pharisee. The professor was a faithful man who could not understand the randomness of his diagnosis. And who among us has not made a silent promise in prayer? or in hope that if we try harder, and do better, that we might get the answer that, that we want, the outcome that we, that we want. For me, the tax collector's prayer is a much, much more difficult task. It illustrates relinquishing all control. For the tax collector, there is not just one more thing to try, or one more bargain to make, or deal to finagle. The tax collector, it's a final prayer, a final plea for kindness, for relief, for mercy. So is the message that we need to bottom out to understand how we should pray? Well, I, I hope not. But I also think that we're challenged to remember that our egos are a formidable stumbling block. And just being aware of that fact is a good place to start. One of my most beloved spiritual mentors died this year. He was an Episcopal priest. He was my mother's first cousin, a man who grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth, only to lose his father very young and his mother to suicide not much later. He dropped out of college, flew as a paratrooper in the Navy, got tattooed head to foot, left the service to become a roustabout on an oil field, got married, had three daughters, raised them on a sheep farm in Tennessee. He could be contentious. He found his way to seminary in his mid-30s and ultimately became the rector of St. Augustine's in Washington, DC. John was the Pharisee and he was a tax collector. He was complicated, prone to bouts of being judgmental and dismissive. And he prayed with persistence and he prayed with humility, and he listened with the heart of a man who had suffered and had known great joy. And there was no one with whom I felt more at ease in sharing my own mistakes and vulnerability. Henry Nowen wrote, the main question is not how do we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our roundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. In the epistle this morning, the writer speaks for Paul at the end of his life. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. These are the words that were spoken at John's funeral last summer. Keeping the faith does not mean that you're not wrestling with it. It does not mean that you are 
constrained by it. It means you're engaging it, putting it into action by leaning into the suffering and joys of others. Loop reminds us that we must first engage from a place of humility and prayer. Only then will we understand the ultimate interconnectedness of all life and God. And then perhaps, too, we can participate in God's call for us to be wounded healers. In the name of the Holy Trinity, amen.